So um, hopefully you're all here for, actually I'm just going to skip past these. These are just pictures of random robots that I pulled off the internet because for some strange reason they amused me. And they highlight that the amount of computing power that are, that's in any of these is probably, you know, what's in your watch. That one I'm pretty sure doesn't have any computing power. So um, hopefully you're here for the building interesting robotics using complex x86 uh, computers. Uh, if you're not, you're welcome to stay. Uh, or you can leave. I mean, that's up to you. Uh, my name is John Hawley. I'm a senior systems engineer at Red Hat. At least I'm pretty sure, yep. And uh, just to note, everything I'm talking about today is not my day job. My day job is cluster file systems in the cloud which is also excitingly interesting or boring, depending on your perspective. So uh, we'll get right to it. Uh, what is a robot? So most people actually get this really, really excitingly wrong. Um, a robot is a machine capable of carrying out a complex series of actions automatically. That's the key word in that sentence. Uh, especially one programmable by a computer. Unfortunately, all of the robots in this room are not actually robots. They're glorified remote control cars, at least right now. Uh, uh, in science fiction, they usually look like people. And sometimes this uh, robot is used to refer to people. So, um, specifically, public servants are not expected to be mindless robots. Uh, check word from the 1920s. So, but why are robots so hard? Mostly it's the battery issue, just to be honest, because batteries are heavy and powering these things is impossible. Um, CPU, or getting enough CPU power to do anything is hard, um, and they're unbelievably complex and expensive, and yeah, batteries. Oh, there it goes. But that's enough random, ridiculous background about robots. Um, but yeah, I mean, the big question here is not why should you build a robot? If you're in this room, you all want to build a ro robot. That's not a question. It's what, why you should use an x86 to build a robot, as opposed to an Arduino, or buying a cheap laptop, or buying a Raspberry Pi, or pretty much anything else. And it's a pretty good question. I mean. You know, something like the middle board costs $199, and an Arduino you can pick up for 20 bucks. So the question is, why do you care? And the reason is, because you get better performance overall per, uh, per uh, performance per watt. And I say that uh, with the full expectation that somebody's going to start a holy war over what I've just said. And I apologize for the destruction of many, many mailing lists over that. But the, it's, you know, you get a couple of watt, or you get a couple of uh, amps of power, a couple of watts of power, and what can you do in that? And that's all that matters. Um, you could uh, the minnow board, uh, which I just had up there, draws about two and a half uh, amps of power. That, so that gives you about 25 watts. Yeah, get, uh, no, 15 watts uh, of power to work with. And a, a Raspberry Pi draws just a hair less than that. And the middle board trumps it on just about every possible benchmark you could think of. The Raspberry Pi is about two and a half watts. Is it two and a half watt? Yeah. Uh, you can run it barely on like, the USB spec. Okay, so you can run it barely on the USB spec, whereas the middle board you uh, have to run it on the USB, the unofficial USB recharging spec. Two of them. Four times as much. <laughs> yeah, that is four times as much. But you still get significantly more performance out of a uh, 32 bit atom oh I, I yes. e everything I'm doing on the, the the robot right now the Raspberry Pi cannot actually do the Raspberry Pi grinds to a halt I did actually try it once um, and it, it's mainly because uh, the CPU and the USB controller have issues yes. yeah, <laughs> yeah the performance just sucks but um, yeah, so yeah, there's a holy war that'll start from that. And I mean, while the Raspberry Pi is nice, because um, it, it, it's almost like a, a real off-the-shelf computer that you can start doing 
you know, normal things with. You've still got a USB port, despite the fact that it's almost unusable. And I don't think, no, it doesn't have a SATA port, does it? No. But it's got some GPIOs and it's got some other stuff. No RTC. No RTC. That's, that could be an issue, depending on what you're doing. But um, you can basically just use random off-the-shelf components with, you know, either a Raspberry Pi or, or the Minnow board. An Arduino, you pretty much have to either hope that there's a shield that already exists for it or you have to make it yourself. And that, you can go either way on that. Um, software is a little bit easier for uh, off-the-shelf kind of component, or for x86. You know, you, in some cases, you can just take whatever's on your laptop and copy it straight over. And in fact, that's most of what I've done for my development. The only caveat, at least with the Minnow board, is that it needs to be 32-bit as opposed to 64-bit. But that's a relatively minor difference, sort of. Two. Eh. Um, I mean, if nothing else, cross-compiling from 64-bit to 32-bit is significantly simpler than cross-compiling from any x86 type thing to ARM or MIPS or really anything. I mean, there are some distributions handle that kind of cross-compilation better, but it, it, you, it will, you'll still screw up at some point and you'll upload something that's x86 to your... Um, your ARM-based system, and it will explode and cause kernel panics, and people will cry, and hopefully nobody dies. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, but you actually get a single platform standard as opposed to like on ARM. How many different ways can you boot an ARM? Can be tr quite truly answered by how many ARMs are there? <laughs> He's trying hard, no, it, it's, <laughs> he's trying hard to, to gloss over the fact that ARM is almost a completely broken standard from fi finding all of your hardware devices to getting it to boot. You boot usually sort of mostly works, or if you're lucky, Lilo, or I don't think SysLinux works on it yet. Give them another couple of weeks and that'll be fixed probably. Um, you can use Oh yes, yes, you could use the GPU to boot your system. That's a, no, that's a horrible idea. No, it's, no. I'd, I'd much rather have an x86 where at least I get the wonderfulness and sarcasm tag uh, that is UEFI um, or BIOS. Yeah, that's not really any better than UEFI. So, but at least it's a single standard. It's ex it, you know, my robot boots exactly the same way that my laptop does. It's not. Um, I apparently forgot to disable something on my power management. <sighs> yeah, my, I, yeah, I've got to remember to turn that off on my robot too. Uh, yeah, but it's, it, it makes it simple. It makes it a lot easier to explain to people, do you understand how your computer works? Yes, your robot works the exact same way. And uh, it's not a microcontroller. I mean, an Arduino, they're useful. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna knock them, they're cheap, they're useful. I've used them in a whole number of applications, but as you can see, K9's just sitting here right now playing video. Not exactly an Arduino's forte. And I pretty much got the ability to play that video right now for free just because I have a slightly better machine. Well, okay, slightly being eight times the cost and a bajillion times the performance, but that's neither here nor there. And yeah, I, I kind of glossed over this, but Arduino has all those shields. Yep. But you don't get to use things like USB, PCI Express, PCI, MSATA, SATA, FireWire. Um, somebody told me ISA. I don't know why anybody wants to use ISA anymore. Please, if you're using ISA, I, I, I've got a new machine for you. Um, yes? I, I can't restrain myself any longer. Uh, there is the Intel Galileo board. There is the Intel Galileo board. It also has USB. And it does have access to all of the shields. But the fact that it has USB means that pretty much you can get anything you want on it. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I mean, it, it, yes, the Galileo, uh, which came out two days after I wrote this presentation. Yes. To, hmm? So the, uh, so the Intel Galileo is a 
Arduino compatible x86 based um, little microcontroller thing that you can run Linux on or that you can run a full normal um, Arduino stack on. It's interestingly meshing the two universes. I believe they announced pricing at $59.99 or something along those lines. I believe it was just under, you know, just under $60, so $59.99. But it, it's, it, like I said, yeah, it came out, uh, they got announced two days after I wrote the presentation. And it's, it is an interesting crossover between now, uh, you know, I've got, an, I've got everything set up for my Arduino, but it's not powerful enough. Now I'm going to take that Arduino, spend twice as much money, get an x86, and now I've got all the power in the universe. And a USB port, because... Uh, well, yes and no. If you treat the x86 as um, an Arduino, you retain all of the real-time stuff because it's execute. It's there's no operating system. The bootloader just loads your code, and off to the races you go. Uh, that is my understanding of the architecture. I, but again, I work for Red Hat. I'm only reading public specs, so I I defer to the Intel people if they wish to correct me on that statement. I hear no corrections. So, <laughs> so either they don't know, or, um, but that is my understanding. Now, if you, if you load up Linux, yeah, uh, you're going to lose all of the typical real-time um, stuff that you would get out of an Arduino. But that's kind of to be expected if you're running anything heavier weight than an Arduino. But, um, but yeah, I mean, a, a, an x86 platform, or in, the, or in the case of the Raspberry Pi, um, you actually get mostly a, a standard looking system. So you can just go, hey, you know, my robot needs to be able to do better on the fly graphics processing. Great, I'll go and buy an NVIDIA card, drop it in, and now I can do everything on a graphics card. You'll probably need to increase your power supply to something obscene, but you, you could do it. I wouldn't recommend it. But, um, but Arduinos are cheaper. That's only actually sort of true when you get down to it. If you take a look at an Arduino Uno uh, R3, it starts at about 30 bucks. That's not too bad. But then to get audio out, you have to add another $22. And then to get Ethernet out, you have to add another 45. And then to get an SD card, you have to add another 19. So by the time you've almost recreated a minnow board using an Arduino, you spend $116.90. At least these are according to the prices I pulled off of, I think, Adaford uh, two weeks ago. Now, a minnow board, on the other hand, costs $199. And you get all of that without, uh, in one package already, plus a bunch of other stuff, like a USB port. And not that I really love USB ports, but they do make your life a lot easier. And yeah, it, it, uh, an Arduino, oh, actually, I did put a Galileo in there. <laughs> See, I was getting to it. Um, and yeah, it, it, uh, an Arduino is not a bad place to start. I mean, it, they are cheap just to get going. And you know, if you're a high school student or a middle school student, yeah, go for it. I'd highly recommend an Arduino in a heartbeat. But on the upside, you now have the Galileo, which you can upgrade to when you outgrow the Arduino. And you don't have to change everything that you're doing uh, just to do that, so. I don't even know what all the ports on the Galileo are. Yeah, there's some stuff. You can do things with it. But you're not all here to listen to me blather on about x86. You want to hear me talk about K9. Uh, why did I actually build this ridiculous robot? Mostly because I felt like it, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, a friend of mine was really into Doctor Who back when I lived in Albuquerque. And I had just gotten done building a Starship bridge, which, yeah, it's... <laughs> you know, you build a Starship bridge and you're going, you know, well, what do I do now? And I'm like, oh, you know, I'll just build K9. And so I started building K9. And if nothing else, it has some, it's really nice. It, at least over here, it's unbelievably iconic. I'm not sure that there's an actual Brit that I've run into who has not immediately recognized it or gone, I know what that is, and I can't, th give me a minute, it's K9. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I've run into anybody who hasn't been able to recognize it. In the US, it's not, 
apparently nobody watches Doctor Who in the U.S. Because I've, I've taken K9 for a walk around my neighborhood, and that did not end well. Mostly because they're like, what the heck are you doing? Like, I'm walking my dog. They're like, but, but it, I'm walking my dog. So yeah, I've become that guy in the neighborhood. Um, I mean, it's just kind of fun. It's got a giant interior, which makes it a lot easier to work in. And you can do crazy stuff like voice. And it's got a TV screen on the side. I don't know why they decided to put a CRT on the original K9. It was kind of ridiculous, but they did. And that's what I've recreated with an LCD. And there's a bunch of vital statistics on what's actually inside of the, the thing. Uh, the thing to specifically point out is the minnow board. And I started this entire project with a Fish River Island 2 board, which is kind of like a minnow board, only significantly more expensive and a pain in the ass to use. And then I got a minnow board, and then everything got better, and I didn't hate the, the um, programming for it. It's got a Robotech motor controller, some motors, and some tank treads, and a bunch of other stuff that's kind of random. But yeah, it's got some hardware. It does things. Oh, and the uh, the battery packs are not, or the number of battery packs is actually wrong on there. It's got four now, because you know you can't have, you can't, you can never have enough batteries. And yeah, that just goes back to my slide where I was talking about, you know, you need more batteries, more batteries, so many more batteries. But um, yeah, I'm just going to blather at this point unless people have questions. And in the back, uh, behind me, my computer is going to start just cycling photos. So. So yeah, no, so uh, like I said, I was just harping on how much I love USB. Everything in, or there's one device that does not talk USB. And that is my ridiculous GPS GLONASS device. And that only talks Bluetooth. But otherwise, everything else talks USB. The um, motor controller, uh, the Robotech mo motor controller has a 12 megabit USB serial interface. So I'm literally shoving commands down um, just a serial protocol from the, uh, the minnow board to the motor controller as fast as is humanly possible. That's actually, oh, that's actually the motor controller right there in completely and utterly blurry vision, which is probably more just the downgrading of the video signal. But yeah, so the, um, like I said, it's, a, it's more or less a glorified remote control car right now. So it's got um, a, an Xbox 360 controller, and that's just being fed in as a joystick interface through a USB port. The minnow board does a bunch of processing based on that, and, out, and it just outputs everything back to the motor controller via USB. Um, the fidgets, three-axis, accelerometer, gyroscope, compass thing, talks USB. Um, the Wi-Fi card that's in it right this minute, USB. Um, that'll change in a week when I can put the uh, PCI Express uh, card back in it. But um, yeah, it, it's, it's all USB. There's nothing fancy here. I'm not doing any bit banging across the GPIO. I'm not doing any crazy spy stuff. This is all, you know, it, effectively by using USB, I've turned everything into a software problem. So as long as Linux had the, you know, has the drivers for the device, which thankfully everything I've, got, I've had has had a driver for Linux. You know, it just makes everything basically trivial. Open a bunch of serial ports and off to the races. Is that entirely user space driven? Yes. Well, I mean, the drivers are in kernel space for the most part. But yeah, everything I'm doing is in uh, user space. So, I mean, the, the joystick, I just pop open the joystick libraries and just start reading stuff. The serial interface, it's just, um, they provide a library, but it's just like a raw serial interface, and you just pop it open and start shoving stuff down the pipe. And I mean, you can get a lot of inf because it's serial, I can get a lot of information back from the devices as well, like the serial or the motor controller. I can ask it how much power each motor is drawing. I can ask it um, how much uh, power the battery is outputting, voltages. Um, uh, I've, uh, it can read. Uh, encoders off of the motors, so I can get exactly how fast each, uh, yeah, the head's gigantic. Um, uh, I can get pretty much any kind of information I could want from that. The, the fidget, I mean, it's uh, outputting data at just a disgustingly, uh, it's almost flooding the USB bus, it's outputting data so quickly. So, um, yeah, it, it's, it's all USB. 
and it make it by far simplifies everything. I mean, you can ask Beth, you know, how much random little bit banging she's got to do with the GPIOs uh, on hers, and it's it's not as pleasant as oh look, there's a serial interface. Hi, make motor one go this fast. So, any other questions? I do have prizes for people who ask questions. <laughs> I'm not going to throw it at you because it, it, it unfortunately has sharp, pointy uh, edges, and I, I'm sure I'll poke somebody's eye out. Thank you. <laughs> uh, K9 will not be flying. Uh, the second generation K9 is not canon, according to Doctor Who, as far as I'm concerned. So. Yes, in the future, uh, so my plans, my immediate plans are to upgrade the motors because good lord it can't actually move on carpet very well. I may have chosen motors that are only good for about an 8 to 12 pound robot and K9 now weighs about 35, 40. So, um, so that's the immediate plan. The next plan is I've got three connects uh, sitting on my desk waiting for me to get back to them and start tearing them apart. My intention is to have one in the back, one in the front to do collision avoidance and to start being able to hopefully track things. And that's going to depend on how much I can get out of the, the sensors themselves and out of the software without having to extend it too much because this is my hobby project and I don't want to turn this into my life. So, you know, rewriting Freenect to, uh, to do something else is not on my to-do list. So. Gosh darn it. Stupid laptop of stupidness. Yeah, that's my, that's my workbench now. Yeah, I didn't have that when I started building this in Albuquerque. I was doing it on a table in my backyard. And it was, yeah, it was not pleasant. So, somebody else asks a question, they get a prize. <laughs> Oh, you've got one? Yeah, sure. Come on, there's got to be more questions. What language did you write? I wrote it in C because I'm masochistic. And um, <laughs> uh, when I, well, actually, it was more along the lines of when I started with the Fish River Island 2, trying to get Yocto and Angstrom and everything compiled for it so that I had a real distribution to work from was a pain. And it never actually quite worked right for me. So I used the default distribution, which is basically a kernel and a busy box. And that's about all you get. So I statically compiled a binary using C just to get it there and get it up and running. And uh, when I um, switched to the minnow board, I switched to the minnow board about three weeks ago, uh, which was a bit of an exciting time because I was still doing all of this work and having to switch, swap the brains out at the same time. And surprisingly, that was pretty painless other than a couple of bugs that uh, Beth was actually helping me with it. And um, other than a couple of bugs that we ended up filing against the Octo project it itself, it was, you know, I took the same binary, got it over there, moved on with life, and it pretty much just worked. And I've extended it a little bit. But I'm not as required to be, uh, I need it to be static because I actually have a libc now. So. And yes, the body is made out of cardboard and paper tape and paint. Those notes, printed pops yet? Uh, there are three pieces, there are three printed parts on the dog, and they're all on this side, so you can't actually see it, and my skirt fell down. Um, there are three, there are three printed parts, and you can't actually say, see them, but they are the K, a dot, and a nine. <laughs> because it, this font doesn't exist anymore in the real world that they used in the 1970s, at least as far as I can tell. And me trying to cut out those shapes was going to be impossible, and I have a 3D printer, so I just printed them. It looks to me like the font of the, uh, the magnetic lettering on the checks. Uh, yeah, it, it, uh, it's a little bit like that. It might be. I haven't, I... I didn't try too hard. I had a 3D model that existed with the K and the 9 already correct. So I just grabbed them, threw them into the printer, and said, print. And two hours later, it decided that it was going to print. Oh, that might actually be the end of. Wow, quickest. That may be the quickest I've ever gone through my slides. Clearly, I'm not talking enough. I mean, do you guys want to go, see it go downstairs or something ridiculous or what? <laughs> Come on, there's got to be more questions. 
Okay, how many people actually want to build a robot? How many people have built a robot? How many, of there, how many people in here built a robot that was actually useful? No, you can put your hand down, Beth. <laughs> how many people have a Oh, no, that, okay, yeah, I do have a hoovering robot at home, and my girlfriend made fun of me for buying it, but it's, uh, I've never actually used it to hoover. Um, uh, my intention is, is that I'm going to tear out most of it and I'm going to build a very small doll like on top of it. So <sighs> I haven't done that yet. <laughs> Mainly because people thought K9 was funnier instead of me building a little Doomba that'll run around screaming, exterminate the dirt, exterminate the dirt. So. Okay, well, if you, not, yeah, you can see it. Well, people have been watching it move all weekend. I can't imagine you guys want to see it move some more. Woo. Can we see it turn around? <laughs> no. <laughs> like I said, the, the tank treads are two feet long as they, as they touch the ground. And like I said, the motors are not correctly powered. So you can come in if you want. I was just going to deflate this balloon because we, we had a contest last night. It wasn't much of a contest, honestly. Do you have the video? I do have the video. It's uploading to YouTube right now. As we speak, my laptop is doing something vaguely useful, as opposed to can just blank. Video? I can play the video. Well, you guys were all there last night, right? Who wasn't there at the, the thing last night? Oh, God. Play it anyway. I'm going to play it anyway, then. <laughs> well, if you weren't there... probably need to do this on that screen because otherwise this isn't going to work right. Of course, now I can't actually see what I want to do. Um. There we go. So that was the race last night. <laughs> And by race, I mean a slaughtering, because someone... So, so a valuable lesson was learned last night. Someone decided that using an ad hoc wireless network to send XML RPC packets to and from their robot was a brilliant control mechanism. My intern. <laughs> That's her claim anyway. But the short answer is, it's a horrible, horrible idea, and you shouldn't do that. Uh, so yeah, so there was a complete slaughtering because for some strange reason, the wireless didn't work at a conference full of tech geeks. Because that never, ever happens. Ever. So yeah, I just decided, I got bored and like just sat there waiting for the, do uh, for the blimp to come back and just, yeah, it was... <laughs> I think the only way Beth could have won at that point was to... Uh, to actually have somebody else carry her blimp down and back, which she did at one point. And then I, had to, uh, then I was just like, okay, gosh darn it. So I just had the, dr the dog drag her all the way down. But we didn't attach it well enough so I couldn't drag it back, so oops. So yeah, so somebody lost the race. And despite the fact that I get bragging rights for the next year, I'm gonna deflate this stupid thing. <laughs> And then I'm probably going to talk real funny. That is true. I did make a promise. I said I'd disconnect. It is no, 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 What are the promise? No, I'm not huffing helium so that I sound funny. Because I'm sure somebody will uh, sit here and uh, take video of me talking funny. And I don't want that on the internet. <laughs> so, uh, no, I've had enough funny things said about me on the internet. <laughs> so. Yeah, the, the, the Yocto blimp. I, you know, there will be a rematch next year because uh, Beth has declared that uh, she wants to win the title back. And I believe her plan is to use a swarm of quadricopters because uh, we've proven that flying works so well and uh, coordinating a swarm of flying objects will totally be easier than flying a blimp. Like I said before, you won a race. I participated in the miracle of 
I, yes, you did participate in the miracle of flight. I will, I will grant that. So. Oh, yes, a swarm of interns might actually help her more. <laughs> it's true. Cold or not, it is true. Come on, any other questions? I've got dogs to get rid of because I don't want to take them home. You may ask me anything. Oh, you guys will suck. <laughs> don't make me just start throwing dogs at you because they will hurt when they hit you. <laughs> Plans for the ears. So the plans for the ears, I haven't quite decided. My original intention was to actually uh, wire them up to the Wi-Fi uh, on, the, on the system, but I'm not sure I want to do that now. Uh, yes, because we've proven that Wi-Fi and XML RPC control mechanisms are brilliant plans. Thank you, Beth. You know, yeah, there you go. There you go. Voice control, uh, yes, voice control would be awesome, um, and that uh, I want to do that. But everything I've tried that's Linux and uh, vo uh, voice recognition has not worked well. That was the one. That, that's the one that sucked the least. I know. It, you know, the, the the more bits and the faster processor may not do well. Oh no, no that, that's when you get uh, subvoke mics. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, I played with Pocket Sphinx for about a half an hour. Um, and one, I actually got it to work, which was better than pretty much everything else I, I tried, which everybody else, you know, congrats, I actually got one of them to work. But um, yeah, it, it, it got about every third word I tried with it to work, but I am, yeah, I was using its general vocabulary. Oh, okay, so if I can just cut the dictionary down and, okay, that'll help, that should help significantly. Okay, oh, my video got done. I was going to say, I can show you videos of it wandering around in Mountain View if you wanted, but that's about the only other thing I can do. I think. Going to proper legged robots is really, really hard. Especially if the dog is not running with six legs suddenly. Yes, that, yeah, that would be, yeah, that would not be good. No, I, I, I love the videos I've all seen of like the, uh, the US DARPA mule thing, that it's got the, the four legs and it runs at like 40 miles an hour or something like that. I love those, but I do not have the six billion dollars to invest in the R&D for having legs. I was going to say, I think K9 right now, including his shipping crates, because he did get over here in three Pelican cases that somehow customs did not open and that the TSA did not flag for any reason, which I brought 40 amp hours of batteries with me. I'm not entirely sure how that didn't. Uh, I have not gotten it home yet, but it's going home via a separate path to me. So it, mm, we'll see if it makes it. No, I, you know, uh, so the question was, is, did I have to do anything special to get it here, basically, right? And I showed up at the airline and I said, hi, I have these three Pelican cases and I wish to make them show up in Europe. And they're like, so that will be $200. And I paid them $200 and they, and they asked, is there anything weird in there? And I said, well, does a robotic dog count as weird? <laughs> <laughs> and they thought about it for a second and they said, no. <laughs> and so then I got on a plane, and the dog got on a plane, and then I went to Heathrow, and I went through customs, and they took my picture four times. <laughs> then I got on another plane, and then I showed up in Edinburgh, and then I wandered to the Edinburgh customs area, which wasn't manned, which was interesting, because I didn't expect that. And I picked up my cases, and I opened them up, and I found nothing from the TSA or from Heathrow, and I closed them, and I came here. <laughs> So clearly, flying with robotic dogs is really, really easy. Easier than with prison. Well, you flew out of PDF, right? I flew out of San Francisco, actually. So. Either one. Flying outside out of Detroit. 
No, yeah, if I flew out of Detroit with a robotic dog, I think they'd probably freak out. And, I, you know, I'd be put on some watch list for the rest of my life. That question would be answered very differently in some place other than San Francisco. <laughs> that is true. Well, my hat goes off to British Airways for actually getting the dog here in one piece. I also take my hat off to Pelican for making the most indestructible cases on the planet. So, any other questions? Otherwise, you can go mill about or come up and I'll take them apart or something. Can you take the top off? I can take the top off. Actually, why don't I just take it all the way down to its, uh, its skivvies, so to speak. Because I don't think too many people have actually seen it uh, all the way down to just the motive unit. Yes, you can totally watch it go downstairs. Three stairs right here. Conveniently placed. Not necessarily by me. But, um... And that's about how that gets shipped. And now, he can turn. Assuming he can get some traction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the going up the stairs I don't have working because, again, those motors underpowered problem. Just replace the tracks with a hoverboard. Yes, let me get, okay, step one, let me invent the hover uh, board. Step two, then I'll replace both tracks with hoverboards. What? Yes, <laughs> there is, no, no, there's some question marks involved, and then step four is profit. So. I was going to say, if you would like to drive it, you're welcome to come up. Do you guys have robot wars in the U.S.? We do have robot wars in the U.S. Um, I think it stopped being broadcast a couple of years ago, but we still, I think the competition still goes on. The rules have changed dramatically because they, um, everybody figured out like one magic design that couldn't be beat, and then they kept trying to replicate that exact same design and then pit it against itself effectively. So it got really, really boring. But I think they've been modifying the rules every year slightly so that it forces um, actual ingenuity to happen. But so what do you mean? Uh, no. Um, I'm pretty sure a good swift kick would not only break your foot, but it would probably destroy it. I mean, it, it is only you know pine board and a bunch of screws and my blood. <laughs> I think there's some blood still in there. I think I didn't replace those parts yet. But um, there you go. Questions? Coming? No? And if you haven't gotten one of these, at least for showing up, I'll give you a dog, because I don't want to take them home. <laughs>